This episode of the House of Mystery is brought to you by Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. LegacyFoodStorage.com New U.S. sanctions on Iran took effect today. Six months after President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the international nuclear deal. The sanctions target Iran's shipping, financial, and energy sectors, all key to the country's already struggling economy. The bombs, which the FBI referred to as improvised explosive devices, were sent to the FBI's bomb laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. We're in Mexico again tonight as thousands of migrants try to find a faster way to the U.S. border. The White House says it's now getting help from the Mexican Breaking news out of Pittsburgh. The man accused in the shooting at the uh, synagogue in Pittsburgh is pleading not guilty, and he also wants a jury trial. Which he's facing a 44 counts. So in the final seconds before the Boeing 737 Max crashed into the water, it was traveling at more than 500 kilometers an hour. All 189 people on board were killed. You've now entered the House of Mystery. Crime, conspiracy, history, and science. With your hosts, Al Warren, Mike Brown, Julie Saab, Michael Butterfield, Dr. Joseph Usinski, and Michael Hawley. Heard on KCAA 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. And today, sitting uh, side chair is John Copenhaver. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Al. How are you? I'm always good. Not really, but I say it. <laughs> um, okay, so now we've got an uh, exceptional writer. We've got uh, Wendy Hurd on the line. How are you doing, Wendy? Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I'm doing really well. Thank you. So, Wendy, this is the first time you've been on this show, so... Make sure your seatbelt's in there, tight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, actually, uh, this is interesting. So you've got three books out, it looks like. What, mm-hmm. what? How did it start for Wendy? How did writing start for Wendy? Oh, God. I started writing really young. Uh, right out of high school, I was like, I'm going to write a great American novel. And I did <laughs> not write a great American novel. I wrote a really <laughs> terrible novel by an American Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> it was called Circles and it was about the circles we traveled in getting to know ourselves. And that one just never got published for some reason. And then I took a long break of sadness before I started writing again. And then I got to it. And then I actually like, you know, tried to learn the industry and tried to figure out how to write a book with a plot and all those good things. Oh. Um, and then it took years, though, like years and years of writing books and not getting them published, et cetera. I think my first published book is like my seventh book that I finished. So, so, but, okay, so, but what was it about writing that kept you going? Because I'm just saying, okay, so first of all, you put out this book and in your mind, it's going to be a great, great book and everybody's going to love it. And it doesn't happen. And then you put out several other books after a little depression crash and you're still trying to get this book published but what was it about writing that would make you go through all that and not just give up that's a great question uh, no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i think um it's like one of these things where you know sometimes like, for example, I like other creative things. I have a degree in painting. I did music for a long time. Um, you know, there's a lot of creative things that I really enjoy. And But for some reason, writing seems to be the thing that, how can I explain it? It's like I carry it around with me. Writing's the one that goes everywhere with me. If I'm in a bar, I'm making stories that are about the people in the bar. If I'm, you know, if I'm, for example, I got my COVID vaccine because I work in education yesterday. And I just got that yesterday. And it, 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 thank you. And they're giving out the vaccines in an abandoned Ikea. And it's like the most (laughs) dystopian thing I've ever seen. And I'm sitting here and there's this place where you sit after you get your shot to make sure that you don't like go into anaphylactic shock or like die. And so you're sitting like 12 feet apart from all these people just facing forward in this abandoned Ikea. And it's like, 
it's a story. You know what I mean? Everywhere you go, there's just a story, a story, a story. And so I don't know. It just, it's like, if I didn't write them down, I'd just be writing it in my head all the time. So I might as well write them down and turn it into a craft. Wow. No, I just, I just, I'm always curious because when people are faced with uh, a struggle um, of, of trying to accomplish their dream, um, they're, they're what's what's the point that you do give up you know like how far would you go so i i find that yeah really, you know it's interesting to see how important it is to a writer um uh, and so you said learning the craft but it's, it's the craft of of writing um as important as the story okay so i mm-hmm. i get i don't know if i'm gonna have people necessarily agree with me but i really felt like <clears throat> when i stopped thinking of it as an art and started thinking of it as a craft that's when I started to become an actual writer like when I stopped thinking that the things I was saying were important and that that my ideas were important and that you know that there was such a thing as fine art and when I let go of the idea of anything like that and I just started trying to consider it like a construction worker building a structure Mm -hmm. and um when I got all of that ego out of it and got less precious about it. So I could throw out a whole book if it wasn't good. I could throw out chapters. There weren't any precious lines in there that couldn't just get reused some other time. You know, there weren't any characters that I couldn't just plug into a different plot at another time. Like everything kind of became less precious to me. And then I was like, once I kind of got into that mindset, I was like, now I can get to work. Now I can become a, a writer who can see my own work critically and become you know, let's egotistical and I can actually grow now. And that's when I started actually writing books that eventually could get published, you know? Mm. Well, that's me. Exactly. I totally agree. I understand. Yeah. But this is the show that everyone loves to hate. So, <laughs> so, but I, I, I agree with you, Wendy, yeah. too. So you've got two, two folks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, cause, okay. Cause I write, I write some books that are completely commercial and I don't mean that in a bad way but it's it's the right formula it's just the right thing and then there's some books i feel feel are more important but the things i think that i write that are really good don't do near as well as the others i don't know if that makes sense yeah i mean yeah. it's funny because what you it's the the books that i have loved or like the stories that i have loved that i have had are not necessarily the stories that readers have connected with the most, you know? And so you just kind of got to put stuff out there. You don't know what's going to stick. You don't know what's going to be popular. It's like something that's really precious to you. It maybe it's just for you, you know, you just really don't know. Um, yeah. You just have no, no way of knowing. What kind of writer do you consider yourself then? As in like, what like, kind of, like, are you, do you, what, where do you sit in like uh, in fiction? What kind of area do you sit in? My I'm... agent will tell you upmarket <laughs> thrillers. <laughs> um, and every time she tries to explain it to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, I get it. I know what you mean. Uh, and I'm like on the other end of the phone, smiling at myself in the mirror, like, I don't know what she means. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I kind of know. I mean, it's like um, there's really straight commercial thrillers, right, where, um, you know, it's not about necessarily anything but the plot right it's a it's a fun ride it's an entertaining ride um it's there's not like a message or necessarily like a theme metaphor um you know that type of thing it's it's really just a straight a commercial story which I enjoy this very much and I don't mean to say that because I think my books are quite commercial so in no way am I I feel like you can't even talk about that type of book without making sure people know that you're you're okay with it because we can be so snobbish about Books about books where the purpose is to entertain, which I don't know why we are so opposed to art being enjoyable, but for some reason we feel like it has to be kind of punishing in order to be good. Um, <laughs> well, and I then, you know, there's like, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to I think there's, it's in, especially now we're in that time where um, it, it's, it's easier to put someone down, uh, you know, or if you want to, if you want to, raise yourself it seems like a lot of people lift themselves up by saying bad things about others and commercialism is a great way of of slamming another writer if you if if you maybe they sell more than you and you don't like it Mm -hmm. you think you're better it's like well her yeah she's commercial yeah 
<laughs> I feel like if something has wide appeal, there's almost this like it appeals to the masses. Like the masses are like the dirty little masses, like the, the <laughs> small people who don't understand imp- the, what's real art. You know, that's like, I don't know. I, I, I'm very opposed to, to that. You know, I actually try very intentionally not to use 50 cent words in my books because the last thing I want is someone to read this and to feel like I'm not talking to you. This book's not for you. It's for someone smarter than you. Like that's the last thing I want anyone to ever feel. And so I actually will edit making sure I'm not ever doing that. You know, I want someone to feel very comfortable reading this book if they're not someone who, uh, you know, has memorized the, the thesaurus. I would say that that's two sided, but you know, cause when you, 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 so you're putting together a book and you, you, you want it to be, as um, you want to catch as many people as possible. You want them to feel like they're not on a different level, that they can come into your book and enjoy it and get through the story and, and, and leave with a certain feeling maybe. But mm-hmm. so, so how important is it that you have uh, feedback like your, your reviews, for instance, so, you know, cause this is the online time where, you know, people uh, uh, will write things about you all over the place. Um, does do you follow up what what kind of people say about you sometimes yeah i have a phase when the first when the book first gets on like netgalley and it first goes on to the review sites i'll like keep it i'm so excited that it's on the review sites you know and there that's a really exciting moment because it's the first time it's been out in the world and i sort of can't help but see what people think of it you know mm-hmm. like what's your first one the second one the third one by the time it hits like a hundred, I'm usually very, now I know what people love and hate about it. I've got it. Like I've, I've come to peace with the things that are bothering people. Um, and I've, I've, you know, gotten a little, you know, happiness from the things that people enjoy and I can kind of step away and then I'll focus just more on like, what are the trade reviews and uh, what are the like larger reviews saying um, just, the trade reviews are like a whole heart pounding, uh, you know, industry thing that probably no reader will ever pay attention to, but they are, they're important. You know, they, they kind of determine how your book is viewed in the community and how will it be shelved and how will libraries feel about it? And all these things feel kind of important with those. So, yeah. Yeah. And they're a bunch of nasty people. They are. <laughs> <laughs> They've been good to my book twice. Bobby they have. Stuff, They've, but... I've, I've been, I've been lucky, but I also feel like it's, it's so, I don't, I don't know. I feel sometimes like they can be a bit um, like petty or something. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, but I, yeah. I've been lucky, so I shouldn't complain. Well, one, one book, they weren't, they weren't, they were kind of in the middle, not really nice, not, and it's one of mm-hmm. my best sellers. <laughs> and I've done what, four, four TV shows on it. Um, yeah. You know, so who knows? So maybe I'm just too commercial. I think that's the problem. When you get into NetGalley and you get into Publisher Weekly and, and stuff like that, they're, um, they're kind of top drawer, highbrow, you know? It, it's, it's kind of the way they treat you. Well, it's, it's, it can be really hard. Well, it's so I, interesting because there it's like one person doing it. It's just another yeah. point of view, but they, they're behind this big, you know, they're not, they're Kirkus or, you know, mm-hmm. PW or whatever. So it feels like this whole organization is sort of, you know, saying something about your book, but really it's just another person, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, you, you know, know someone who's, who's yeah. I guess, skilled, but it's you, still you take their name person. down and you find them on social media and you attack them. <laughs> oh no 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 <laughs> no that's just uh, you know i you hear stuff like that you hear of authors like stalking reviewers i've heard i've been in moments where i've heard authors say that they had like stalked reviewers and stuff like that like oh i saw this and then i found her over here and then i saw what she you know i found her on facebook and i'm like that's not cool. You no. know, you put something out there, people are allowed not to like it. It's cool. Right, you know, you right. got it. You got to be okay with that. You can't put something out into the public world and expect everybody to like it. It's just, it will never happen. I heard a good joke yesterday. It said that all one star reviews are just uh, failed writers. Oh. <laughs> oh, I know. I see this is why people love to hate me. Um, really, bo- oh. really bored people. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, yeah. Well, I think I think it's all good. It just yeah. uh, I, I 
try not to even notice them myself nowadays, as long as the overall you do? is good. Yeah, now I've kind of got to a point that um, I don't really look for it. If I happen to come across one, that's fine. But I certainly don't look for them anymore. I look at the overall. Like if you have a hundred yeah, reviews on I something and you've got like a four yep. plus average, well, that's great. I'm happy. If a hundred people read it and give me, um, uh, you know, a four star, I'm thrilled. You know, so it's it's not really. I try not to get into detail myself, but I, you know, yeah. it happens. So you know, your very first book that would be, um, let's see, Hunting Annabelle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where did the idea for that come from? That book was kind of funny. I had, as you heard me say, I had been writing for a long time. I had not been published. I was kind of, I was like, I'm at peace with this. This is just kind of my journey. I'm going to write and it's probably never going to get published at this point. Right. So I kind of um, decided I'm just going to write what I feel like writing, you know, I mean, what do I really have to lose? I mean, I'll write something that's, you know, a genre, like a thriller or something, you know, I, I had known that I, wanted to write in that space. But um, I was like, I want to write something really different, something I have never seen in that space uh, before. And it doesn't matter because it's probably never going to get published. No one's ever going to read it. Um, So I wrote Hunting Annabelle, which is set in the 80s. And it has a a male protagonist. And he's, he has a lot of mental health issues. And he um, falls for this girl who disappears. And the book is him trying to find her, but wondering if he might I've had something to do with it himself. So it's that like unreliable narrator thing, but it's very artsy. He's an artist. He sees auras. It's very eighties. I mean, the whole thing felt so artsy and weird. Um, It was really just for me. And then I had a draft of it. And then I, um, I got really badly injured, like very badly injured. I fell and I broke my wrist and my hip. And so I was I had one whole side of my body that I could not use. So I couldn't even use crutches. If you can picture it, like I had one hand and one leg, but they were on the same side of my body. So I couldn't wheel a wheelchair and I couldn't use crutches. I could use one crutch or I could slide around on my butt. That was what I could do for three months. And I rewrote hunting Annabelle during that three months. And I had, I, it it was a dark revision. (laughs) Like that's when I thought it got pretty dark, you know? And then, I signed with my agent and it sold. So sometimes it's like, maybe you really just have to find that raw thing inside you and just write for that, you know, I guess is maybe. Or do you think it was a sense of freedom? Because at that point, yeah, maybe. Well, I don't care if anybody publishes me or not. I'm just going to do it. Isn't that kind of like a sense of freedom of I'll put down what feels right to me and wherever it goes, it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of write your very personal and specific brand of truth and eventually, you know, maybe one of them will go, you know? Yeah. What do you want people to get out of your books? Like when, if, if I pick up Hunting Annabelle, for instance, and I start reading it, um, is there a certain feeling or a certain, I don't know, a certain thought that you, that you, other than the story itself, that at the end of the book, I, I should have? Yeah, Hunting Annabelle was a really special one for me because I wanted to talk a lot about how um, I wanted to talk a lot about how we perceive uh, good and evil and how fuzzy it can be sometimes when you are the you are the evil or you are the good. You know, I wanted to get inside the head of someone who would normally be shelved under evil but make him the protagonist and make him very sympathetic and make it just kind of upend some of our thoughts about what it feels like to be in that seat. And I'm not, I'm not sure also, I mean, there's, there's a lot in there. I lived in Texas for a few years. So there's a lot in there too about, um, about Texas and about just, um, you know, cultural stuff in there about like, you know, what it felt like to be a Californian in Texas (laughs) and stuff like that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So yeah. Well, it, so are you believing, are you taking the stance that evil, you're born evil, or it's a spiritual <laughs> thing, or is this something that you, you, it's a behavior you learn, you think? That's what I wanted to unpack a little bit. It's, um, and I'm like, I'm, the reason I'm stuttering a little is I'm like, how do I unpack, how do I say this without any spoilers? But like, 
um, you're inside the head of someone that you grow quite fond of and you grow quite sympathetic to. But as the story goes on, you start realizing that this person you've you almost feel like you've been tricked into sympathizing with someone that you wouldn't have if you had been given maybe all the info up front. And I wanted to do that on purpose to sort of, I don't know, unpack some of that and maybe challenge, I, I guess, put a little mirror up for the reader and ask more, ask more questions and answer about what, what do you think about good and evil? Now, what do you think? Like, does this change anything? Like, I just wanted to maybe ask a lot of questions about that. We, we know Kill. I'm um, oh, sorry. No, was, that's interesting. Go for it. Yeah. Kill, Kill Club, uh, the Kill Club, which is your second book. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. very familiar with, um, and I love. It's a great book. It also oh, it also you. is playing with a lot of the sort of moral questions. So it's funny you got, you got, were talking about you know what upmarket thrillers are, but I think there mm -hmm. are big moral questions going through your books that, and certainly Kill Club ha is is deep in those questions as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, I would say that Kill Club is a real, Kill, Kill Club is a very straight and easy question, right? It's like, yeah. what would you, how far would you go? And how is it wrong to go this far when the person in question is like, is it wrong to kill an evil stranger if the person you're doing it to save as an innocent, you know? And like, mm -hmm. what are the, um, what are our thoughts about that? Like, where does that gray morality uh, hit each of us? And The Kill Club is a book I had been wanting to write ever since becoming a mother myself, because, you know, when I had a child, it, it kind of brings this whole um, new person inside of you who will, you know, that mother bear thing where it's like, I mm -hmm. have never had anyone in my life that I would, you know, literally like gnaw my arm off for, you know, <laughs> um, like that I would, that I can see myself uh, putting, you know, doing stuff like that to save. And then I actually read this news story that really got the book started for me about this young mother whose uh, daughter's fault, she had a baby, a son actually, and her baby, her baby's dad um, was killed in the military. And so she was alone in this trailer in the, this rural area. And the next thing you know, she's like got this intruder breaking into her house and she has to shoot him while on the phone with 911. And it's this whole thing. And at the end of the whole thing, she's being interviewed and she says, no one is more dangerous than a mother protecting her baby. Mm -hmm. And I found that so interesting. And I thought it really made me keep go back to that thing I had, you know, been asking myself, like, is there a limit? Is there a limit to what I would do? I don't know that there is a limit. Like, would I cross into really dark moral territory if my if my daughter was on the line? You know, and it, all those questions I thought would be really interesting for a thriller readership because most of our readers are women and mm -hmm. most of them are middle-aged women. So mm -hmm. probably have children. And so I thought this is a concept that will really like resonate with people. Wow. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, on uh, and back on your, I, I, I was going to say on your first book there, um, with the hunting Annabelle, it reminds me of I, I interviewed a serial killer just about a year ago for a book, and he has a new wife, and so uh, and he has had her for about fifteen years. But this is a guy that's killed seven people and he's raped two girls and he just a terrible past. But she sees him as something that's beautiful. So I wonder if it's also a time pattern, like uh, you know, it's kind of like what you're saying you know, you, you kind of, she is getting the sympathy for him because she knows him after the fact. She doesn't know what he's done. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it sort of, so I think that sort of relates to that, to that, to the yeah. evil and whether they're born or, or, or if they, 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 it's kind of crazy, but um, wow, it's pretty interesting. Where do you, where do you do research for these types of books? Oh, the kill club was, well, okay. So I, I like to do interviews personally. Um, Hunting Annabelle, I interviewed a psychiatrist. I interviewed all different people. Um, Kill Club, I interviewed uh, survivors of all the situations in the Kill Club. Like they're the members of the Kill Club are in all these desperate situations. Those, I think I ended up using what, like 10 of them or so. I had dozens of firsthand accounts of people. I had, I started out with this research question, which was, have you ever been in a situation where if a murder club like this was available, 
you would have been tempted to use it. Have you ever been in a situation like that? And I asked women around me and I, like, I know women go through stuff like this all the time. I know it and men too, but mo- you know, I think it's fair to say that this is something that happens more often to women. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had so many stories from women that I had to choose between them of, you know, I had this, you know, the story of the woman who's being stalked at work. Um, he's breaking into her apartment. They won't renew the restraining order. You know, the story of the, the mother whose kid gets taken away because, you know, she's queer and the ex-husband's a lawyer, like all the stories in that book, there's, there were so many that didn't go in that I couldn't put in there. I just ran out of space. Um, and that was really, you know, yeah, I did about a year of that kind of research while I was working on something else. And, That's going to uh, yeah. be hard, right? Because I, when I interview these people, I, I find it can be really stressful. So it, it's got to be hard at times. Were, were there any surprises? I think the big, the biggest surprise was how common it was. That almost everyone I knew had some story. Um, you know, were like, oh, my neighbor. You know, when my husband died, my neighbor was mad that I got dogs and he poisoned them. Or, you know, there's like there uh, just like story after story after story of like, and you know, and the, the police wouldn't do anything, and they wouldn't do anything, and they wouldn't do anything, and there was story after story of that. And so, um, there's just so many ways to victimize someone outside the law, or I guess inside the law. You know, where there isn't. Um, and so I just was surprised by how common I wasn't surprised, but I was surprised. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. right. And, the, and I the thought I'd get a few stories. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it's endless. It, it's endless. Um, but you, okay. So the characters you used in, let's say the kill club, like Carol, the uh, foster mm-hmm. mother and stuff. Now, are they taken from the stories themselves? Or are they totally a creative fictional person that you have? And you've just put them into an event. The main characters in the Kill Club are all created and Carol is kind of like a compilation of a number of different people that I've, you know, like, I think that's how a lot of our characters are, you know, like we have a type of person we want to write about, but it's not a straight person. It's, you know, you've met a number of people that remind you of this, but yeah, there's no, no one who's like a main character in the Kill Club who's straight from life. And I I never do that. I never um, take main characters straight from life. It just doesn't seem fair. I'll take a side character straight from life. Like if I need a, a really realistic guy in a scene, I'll take him straight from life. Um, people don't mind that, but I would never take like a, a person, a real person. If, you, if, if you're in a supermarket and some really nasty person cuts you off or said something bad to you, do you take that person and, and make them suffer? <laughs> I have written in ah, a couple of people. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Now we're getting to it. Yeah. I don't usually write them in and like kill them. It'll be like, I'll write them into a really douchey character mm. and I'll be like, that's who you are. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I still love that question. Cause I got that. Uh, one of the first crime fiction writers I interviewed was JD Horn. And he said that he used to, uh, someone cut him off or said something or was rude to him in the bank or in the store, he would take that character and give them a really bad death. And I thought, wow. Wow. Yeah. Torture them. All <laughs> right. I'm not going for coffee with you. <laughs> I know. I feel like that tells you something about him. You know, it's like, and it tells you something about me. Like I want you exposed for your truth. Like, he wants to like murder you badly. Yeah. <laughs> He's got some information <laughs> built up there. Yeah, you know, exactly. You know, he has got to get an outlet, but uh, yeah, I find uh, crime fiction writers really interesting. So, um, Are you prepared? Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. Go now to LegacyFoodStorage.com. Use coupon code HOM15 now for 15% off. Quick, go. You're listening to the House of Mystery radio show. History. Crime, conspiracy, and paranormal mystery.
now you've got a new book coming out on March Mm -hmm. 30th of this year. So that's exciting. Um, She's too pretty to burn. Mm-hmm. Oh, got it right and um so so it's a great uh, title yeah thank give you us, give us a little bit of a rundown on this uh, what kind of a story is it well it's more of my artsy weird stuff you know um <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's a uh, it's so fun i'm so excited this one's coming out but this is a dorian gray reimagining where it's gender swapped so uh dorian gray is a teenage girl who um, is an unwilling muse for the photographer who falls uh, in love with her. Um, So it's like a romance between the two main characters, Nick and Veronica. Veronica is an aspiring photographer and Nick is a swimmer who has a fear of being photographed, like a real fear, like a phobia fear of being photographed because her mom's a model and has always forced this on her and she like hates it, hates it. And so um, the story starts off with them uh, getting involved with each other and Veronica taking this one picture of Nick uh, after their first kiss that she puts on Instagram and it goes wildly viral and takes over everything um, in a way that is really exciting for Veronica and very dark and um, claustrophobic for Nick. And so Mick gets sort of looped into Veronica's best friend, Nico's antics. He is an installation artist and he does what he thinks of as disruptive installation art, kind of like a more, um, a more dangerous type of Banksy sort of art, like where you're sneaking into places and installing these um, dangerous disruptive installations. And so the story kind of takes a downturn from there and it becomes all very dark and murdery and artsy. Sounds great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, you can tell what he likes. Um, no, yeah, well, I've, yeah, go for it. Well, I mean, I, you know, I'm a high school teacher by trade, so I'm thinking about, you know, it's a YA novel and you're basing it on Dorian Gray, which is a book that for many years I taught to students, you know, with some success and some, you know, mm-hmm. depending on. And um, they were always hooked on the story, right? So it's a great, yeah. I mean, it's some of those, as sometimes the language was hard for them, but they're always hooked on the story. So it's such a great choice to, you know, reimagine. Um, well, thank you. I have a book to recommend students as well. <laughs> well, I don't know if you've ever noticed when you're reading Dorian Gray, but Oscar Wilde is like hella misogynistic. I mean, that guy says mean things about women. Oh, yeah. And oh, so yeah. it's like, I was kind of delighted about the idea of like gender swapping his book because I just felt like it would piss him off in a way that made me really satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> like girls don't deserve this story women are just decorative he says like, okay oh yeah oh yeah okay yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. very misogynist T- times have changed mm-hmm. a little <laughs> mm-hmm. i say a little yeah. depending yeah. on what, mm-hmm. what place you're in but that's crazy it's crazy the, the all the stuff that goes on it, you know like dr zeus and all these different things and mm-hmm. people are waking up to things and i think i think it's hard for a lot of people to move forward with with changes you know but um it, it, it's happening uh, does this sort of affect the way you write because you're writing in modern times here right so um do you feel like you have to be careful on how you um how you get into a story and how people are in the story how your characters act Absolutely. I mean, I want to make sure that like the last thing I want is to spend all this time working on something and then to accidentally alienate a reader just because I didn't take the time to do my research on where society and culture is at right now. You know, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm very all for like if, if one of my books, you know, in the long term is, you know, it, it turns out that I, you know, the message is not no longer aging well and it doesn't belong on the shelf anymore. It's like, take it off, take it off. I can, you know, it's like, it, art's not permanent. I don't know where the idea came from, came to us from that any of this was supposed to be permanent, you know, uh, that just because someone becomes a famous author like Dr. Seuss, um, we never signed a contract to shelve Dr. Seuss for all of eternity, you know, culture changes. Like, I don't know why, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know why it's so upsetting to people to think that the, that nothing is sacred. Everything is temporal. It's like, yeah. It's yeah. life we want, you well, know? That's a hard thing to to um 
to accept, I think, for people. And, if, and I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of people, you know, baby boomers that grow up with, you know, a majority of the people out there um, that are upset have never been writers themselves, probably. Mm-hmm. And so in their ideas, they were taught with certain books and certain ideas. And now they're, you know, 70 years old or whatever age they are now. And um, it, it seems like um, I think they feel like they're, what they did is they're, they're being told everything was wrong. It's all bad. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. that's sort of it. I think I think a person doesn't want to live 70 years and then look back and then have the younger generation say, well, everything you did is wrong. You were terrible. You know, I think that's sort of a, in a roundabout way. I think that's how why a lot mm-hmm. of people get upset because it like, hits that nerve. Yeah. I mean, you know, because in a way, um, you know, Charlie Brown will be next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But. I grew up with Charlie Brown, so I don't, I don't know. I, I, I kind of get both sides of it, but um, yeah, you're right. There is no permanent, you know, so some things last and some things don't, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's like we get this idea that because something gets really um, entrenched in culture, that it's not a sandcastle. It's not a sandcastle. I built it up on this really tall hill. It's not a sandcastle. But like, the sea level is rising and even the sandcastles that are built on really tall hills are still sandcastles and eventually the sea will rise. Um, and that is true for all art. Well, you could have bought uh, Winston Churchill's painting for 11 million. <laughs> 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 that's crazy in itself. Right. Uh, but you know, that's society. Yeah. That's yeah. society. So d- does this sort of the pandemic and this last year has been crazy, right. You know, with, you know, Master Trump and, and, and all of the stuff going on, like the whole mm-hmm. thing, you know, that you could go endless, you know, Jewish laser beams and <laughs> fake snow in I Texas. I forgot about the Jewish laser beams. For yeah, well, well, they, Thanks you know, for the Bill, reminder. Bill Gates used Jewish laser beams to create fake snow in Texas, right? You know, oh, you can boy. just That's right. build off this. <laughs> But with all of that in the world today, there's two there's two parts to this question. One is, you know, because how does this affect your writing? And I mean, one as in um, with so much un- uncertainty around you, you know, the neighbors, the world, and all that. Does that make your writing darker? And the other part of this is, are you going to include any of this chaos in your writing? Because you do write for, you know, in modern times. It's really interesting. You know, all of us behind the scenes are asking each other, are you putting the pandemic in your book? Are you putting the pandemic in your book? And for the most part, I think it's a no. But because, I mean, first of all, I think it's interesting to consider this angle. It's not only what I feel like writing, it's what editors feel like reading if you're trying to sell books right now. Editors don't, um, aren't in the mood for stories that might feel um, claustrophobic or be heavy and depressing because life is so heavy and depressing and claustrophobic, you know? So I actually did write and shelve an entire book while on pandemic because I, I was really excited going into this book because it was really claustrophobic and like rainy cabin in the woods type of vibes. And um, I caught, I, I forced myself to finish that thing, but like, man, I did not enjoy writing that. And I was just like, time for the shelf, time to write a different <laughs> book. Um, so yeah, I definitely, uh, so now I have like two different books that I'm working on and they're both pretty like, travel-y, adventure beachy, like sunny settings. And I'm finding it like, yeah, I think that um, I need to give myself a setting that feels like when I'm writing, I feel like I'm out in the world and on adventures because I am stuck inside so much. In California, you know, we're shut down. I mean, we are like shut down, shut down, except we're lucky to have good weather to be out in like hiking and stuff. But, yeah. you know, we've been shut down for a, like most of this year. Yeah. Well, so, you yeah, just move to Texas. <laughs> They're opening up. <laughs> I've already done that. <laughs> Been there, done that. Don't want to do it yeah. again. I actually, I want to say, I don't want to hate on Texas because I actually really miss Texas. Texas is cool. People yeah. in Texas are very warm. You know, the culture is very casual, very chill, very warm. I do miss Texas all the time. So no well, hate on Texas. There are some great people in Texas. It's just, mm-hmm. uh, just, just a couple of people. But, but that's fantastic. Um, so, but so in a way, it has affected your writing. You are kind of turning it around and and writing a little bit lighter. Then, right? 
I would say it's not any lighter as far as uh, there's not like less death. There's not less darkness psychologically, but the settings, I really tend to, I'm like really not wanting to write um, like indoor settings right now. I'm really wanting to write like travel or um, outdoor settings right now. Adventure-y. Huh. You, mm-hmm. So, so does, does when things are really kind of dark around you, it doesn't necessarily make you write darker then? It will have me write darker, like, um, for example, hunting Annabelle, that's really dark psychologically, but like the settings and stuff in it are quite fun. Like he's in this amusement park all the time. He's out in, um, he's on this road trip in Texas, you know, he's climbing around and breaking and entering. So like the settings are fun, but the psychology is really dark. And that's what I tend to do. Like I was cooped up when I was writing that. That's like the same type of thing I'm doing right now, like really fun settings, but really dark content. Actually, maybe that's a brand I have because Kill Club was like that too. And so She's Too Pretty to Burn is like that too. Huh. Never really thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. Uh, so now on the new book, I always like to find out why you write, write a book. So why, what mm-hmm. made you write this new book, She's Too Pretty to Burn? What was the, um, the, the, the fire behind this? It started with the single idea. Dorian Gray, but with photography. And then it just kind of took off from there. Yeah. This idea that like a photograph on social media could, could, could have the speculative element. Like you don't need the speculative element because the way photographs can go viral can create that magic of sudden fame or of sudden uh, distress, you know, and sort of like subbing in social media um, algorithms as the magic was really interesting. And then just the idea of like a teenage girl photographer and a teenage girl, um, you know, subject, because it's all about vanity and like, who am I as the subject of this art? It just felt like teenage girls were like the perfect people to explore this with. Did you um, set out to write a YA novel or is it just the idea kind of summoned that up? Where, where, what was your approach to that? And, and in writing a YA novel, did you have to think differently about how you how you might set up a thriller? It was kind of like my agent um, does a lot of YA, and she was like, mm-hmm. "If you're interested in writing this YA book, I know an editor I can pitch to or I can work with." Um, like I, she knew that I was hoping to sell something on proposal and not have to do a whole spec manuscript at that point. So it just kind of worked out where she was working with its editor and the editor really liked the story idea. And it just had to be a YA book because that's a YA editor. But besides, I, you know, I really wanted to work with this editor and rightfully so she is awesome. I love working with that editor. I will like follow her through the universe. I love her so much. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, I mean, it just kind of worked out that she's a very collaborative editor So she had like a lot of ideas on what she thought would be good for the project. And I really like that type of collaboration where you're bouncing ideas off each other. Um, And so the idea just kind of formed organically and then, you know, put the proposal together and send drafts back and forth. And then, you know, you got your idea. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, first of all, I I agree with you. Like I really enjoy a great editor is gold and uh, and also that one that's collaborative that way. Um, It's just, it's just like heaven because you're, Mm -hmm. it is such a lonely thing writing. And Mm -hmm. um, did you have to, in in writing this book, you know, since it is sort of a, maybe a slightly different audience than your other books, did you have to, do anything in particular in terms of the crafting of the book for that audience? Is it, in other words, writing YA, did you have to wear a slightly different hat or make yeah. a choice? Can you talk about that a little bit? Really different because, you know, if, like if I'm writing The Kill Club, I'm speaking to moms, I'm speaking to adult women, I'm speaking to adult men, you know, nine non-binary people. I'm speaking to people who are in their 30s, 40s, most of the time, 50s, you know, with she's too pretty to burn my audience is teenage girls age 14 to 18 and so I felt responsibility like I wanted I want to play more carefully with them you know and I want to um respect what I'm saying to them and realize that you know the things that are said to teenage girls are um 
often so destructive and so thoughtless. And I really wanted to be very thoughtful about the kind of things I was saying to them, especially in regards to things like sexuality and gender and the place of social media. And I really wanted to get into issues of consent outside of just sex. Like I wanted to get into issues of consent with photographs um, and like the importance of consent in photography and what it means to have a, per, you know, photographs are permanent. Like, what does it mean to have something on the internet? Um, and I just really want, not in a preachy way, but I wanted to make them feel seen. Like these are real issues that they're, that they're dealing with all the time. And I wanted to, um, you know, be in that conversation with them in a way that made them feel validated, seen, important, um, that made their feelings seem important, that made their, you know, concerns seem important. And I, I just wanted to, to um, be a constructive voice in it, in that conversation. And also I wanted to give them something that was really enjoyable and like fun and twisty and dark and sexy and all the things that help, you know, get someone into a story so that you can think about those larger issues without it being preachy and without it being um, annoying or heavy. Like I wanted to do that all in like a really fun, but dark way. Um, so I felt like I had like pretty high uh, hopes for this story and it, it did take a lot of emotional, it, it did take an emotional toll trying to get all that in and feeling that, that weight of like, God, you know, these are kids reading this. I want to make sure I'm doing this right. You know? Right. Um, so right. yeah. What, what advice yeah. do you give to someone that's a, a new writer? I often say um, that you, that I often recommend just uh, studying a lot and writing a lot, like studying, uh, like, reading a new craft book every time you write a draft, read a new craft book, write a draft, read a new craft book, write a draft, keep writing until it feels less precious um, and keep like, keep that volume up of learning and writing and learning and writing. Um, I recommend that is a good way to. Who, who do you get your inspiration from? Is it other writers or do you look out elsewhere? Like inspiration to write? Like yeah, inspiration like to, what, do you, yeah. what do you think gets into you? um when you write like what what or if you're stuck one day or if you're just kind of in a, a zone yeah. where things aren't happening is there some sort of thing that you can go to like music or other writers yeah I have to create like playlists for each book to help me get in the mood like get the vibe of the book so like I'll have a really extensive or some smaller playlist that I'll listen to like on repeat while I'm drafting that really helps me get the headspace like the visualization of the book um and I need to do things like walk and drive to kind of clear my head. So to going on a long walk and, um, you know, th and thinking about a scene or going on a long walk and thinking about a book I want to write, plus putting in music that feels like the right vibe and just kind of um, like letting that spark uh, inspiration. That tends to be where I'll, I'll go when I'm, when I'm needing inspiration. So you put Metallica on and go for a drive? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> Something like that, or a walk. <laughs> Run over. Do you, share, do you ever make your playlists and share them, like, on Spotify? Or... I do. I always have a Spotify playlist for each book I publish, and I always share them. Um, and I always so put them fun. on my website and stuff like that. I think it's fun. No one ever mm -hmm. seems to care. I think it's fun. That's I have to check it out. I don't even know. I didn't know Kill, the Kill Club had a playlist. Yeah. Oh my god, the Kill Club definitely has a playlist. <laughs> That's a great idea, actually. Do you ever think of going into like true crime or anything, or jumping over because you're so close to it now? I have a book. I I have a like book that I've been wanting to write forever. That's in that vein. Um, yes, actually, there's a um, a serial murderer that I did a lot of research on that I've always wanted to write a book about. Um, it's it would re the research to do that book would be really tough, like a lot of in-person digging through back files and stuff. So I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to do it. But yeah, definitely. Yeah, but it sounds like you're close to that now anyway, in a sense, because yeah. you're doing a lot yeah. of interviews and you're kind of going yeah. through stuff. That's kind of what mm -hmm. it is. It's, it's just, it takes time, but it's not, and, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Well, so how is your day spent then? What do you do day to day in writing? Like how, how does, how does the great Wendy Hurd write? Oh my God. <laughs> uh, well, I have a day job. So I write from like five thirty in the morning until seven thirty in the morning every day before work. And then on the weekends, I usually get in a good three, four hour writing session on Saturday mornings as well. Uh, so I just don't sleep in ever. And then when I'm on deadline, 
I'll write in every weird place you can think of. Like, you, you know, I'll drive my daughter to a thing and I'm writing in my car, writing in the stairwell, writing in my car, writing in, you know, in the reception of the place where she's doing gymnastics. I mean, like, I just kind of piece it all together. It's like patchwork. Can you turn it on like that? But can you, can, I have a, a difficulty doing that to say, okay, well, I'm going to schedule, you know, from five to seven tonight or whatever and, and write. And then to actually sit down at five and then to turn it on and just be able to write. You, you can do that. I plan it all. Like, so the night before I know tomorrow morning I'm writing a scene. So I have my scene planned out that I'm going to write tomorrow morning and, and I'm picturing it in my head all evening. I'm like, okay, they're going to be here. They're going to be there. How am I going to work out that? Will they say this? Is it more of like this vibe? And I'll kind of think that then I'll go to sleep and I'll wake up in the morning and I'll go. And then before I turn off my computer for that session, I'll go, I'll make notes for my next scene. Okay. From here, here's what's going to happen. And I'll kind of make notes in the next, the file for the next scene. And then all day throughout the day, I'll be like marinating on it. Okay. So if they're going to do this, I'm going to do this. And then, you know, the next morning I'll have it in my head and then so forth. So when I'm really on a deadline, that's how I'll do it. Um, and that usually gets a job done. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so what's your relationship like with your characters? I say that because uh, a lot of fiction writers will say they're like my children or things like mm -hmm. that. What's your response? Like, how, how do you feel about your characters? I do love them. I mean, Jazz is my favorite of all my characters I've ever written. She's my, she's my little baby angel in the Kill Club. Um, she's the one who has like the most, I put most, I put more of like personal stuff into Jazz mm -hmm. because she's from LA. She's from working class LA. And so I let Jazz have a lot more of me than I normally give any one character. Um, and then sometimes, you know what? Sometimes I, I don't have a close relationship with them and it's like a professional working relationship. Um, you know, I'm like, we, uh, we don't know each other that well, but we're working together on this project. So um, I, 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 you know, sometimes I just don't, I don't ever happen with a main character, but like a close side character, sometimes I really just struggle to get the flavor of somebody and I'll have to really like work at it. Um, so yeah. Huh. Where does that come from when you say that to struggle uh, to get the flavor of a character? Because, you know, because when I go out and meet someone, they're actually who they are. So it's for me, it's to, f to figure that out for you. It's in your mind, so to speak. So I, I just wonder, how do you know, like, for instance, how a person's going to react, what they're going to say and their, their moods? Yeah, sometimes I have to just write a draft where I don't know them very well. And I just got to try different things. And then I'll, I'll be like, okay, you know what? I think what I'm going to do is that when this person gets angry, they tend to do, they tend to make jokes. That's their defense mechanism. Like, okay, when they feel defensive, they, well, they lash out, you know, and I'll just get to know them better as I'm trying to see how they react to all the things that kind of come at them. I'll, I'll know from the beginning, like, are they really confrontational? They're not, they're self-effacing or they're, you know, funny. Um, and sometimes I have to assign it to them. Like, okay, you're going to be funny. Like, I don't know you, but I've decided you're going to be funny. And I'll try to like, you know, make that work, you know, because I'm just struggling so hard to get, to get their characterization. Um, that can be really hard, you know, and then you go, I do a lot of passes. Like I'll do a whole pass for um, this, this character's particular way of talking, or I'll do a whole pass for this character's uh, physical habits, making sure that the way they handle their body is consistent throughout the book and that stuff. Wow. It's quite the, yeah. quite the process. Now does do you have a website? Do you have a place that you want people to come and, and stalk you or, or send you letters? Yes, come stalk me at <laughs> wendyherd.com. Oh, that's, that's easy. Nice easy. That's yeah. easy. Well, I'll have that up on our website as well so people cool. listening can just find you with one click and they can <laughs> give you, yeah, just, just click and click and run. So I know this is a weird So what's next for you? What's next? I, I cause I know this book's coming out um, mm -hmm. the 31st. So it's soon come out, but I know as being a writer that, You've probably got something else in the wings already going. You know, but you know, it's all publishing. It's like, oh, you've got it. You've got stuff happening. You can tell people in five years, you know, yeah. so <laughs> yeah. there are books coming. Um, I, I do not, I, I do have some stuff that should be announced uh, pretty soon here. And then other stuff that I'm just, I have like, for example, I have a book I'm writing on spec and that one, we'll see what happens. That's an adult thriller that I just set aside to finish something else, but I'm going to pick that back up. Um, and I hope, you know, I'm hoping to finish that later in the year and uh, see what happens with that one. And then mm -hmm. I have something young adult that I'm working on right now as well. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to finish two books this year. 
uh, we'll see what happens with them. Let's see where well, the little I'm book sure. babies end up. <laughs> well, I'm sure you will. Um, our guest today has been Wendy Hurd, and the book we've been talking about all three of her books, but her newest book, which is coming out the thirty uh, first thirtieth of March. Oh, waking up, Al. It's she's too pretty to burn. Thank you for being here, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.